And good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to tonight's webinar, the fourth in our series of webinars on the True Gentleman Experience Explained. Uh, if this is your first time joining us for one of these webinars, it's okay. It's been the same thing uh, the past three night, past three webinars. Uh, I am James Irwin. I'm the director of educational programs for uh, the fraternity, and I'm happy to be here to uh, talk about the program and to answer whatever questions you may have, as well as to talk about the program in general. So. Uh, so starting out with, uh, as you heard, we are recording this webinar. We're going to be posting it to our YouTube channel. Uh, we'll be emailing everybody who attended as well as everybody who confirmed for the webinars. And we'll also be sending out this presentation along with the uh, note slides as well uh, so that you guys can have uh, additional information about this. Uh, as we go throughout the night, you'll see on the right-hand side of your screen where you can enter in questions throughout the webinar. Um, I will answer them either uh, you know, as they come in uh, at the most appropriate time for them. You may not always see a typed answer. I'm kind of a one-man show here uh, answering questions. So uh, you know, talking and typing answers doesn't always work that you know, quickly and easily. So uh, please, at any time, if you've got questions, type them in the Q&A box, and I will happily answer any questions about the, uh, the uh, implementation uh, or questions you have about the True Gentleman experience. So, uh, and let's get started. So first, talking about the mission and program cornerstones of the True Gentleman Experience. Uh, the first and uh, first one is to uh, ensure that. Uh, sorry, people were joining, so I had to uh, let them in. Uh, to ensure that, that uh, you know, from the moment that somebody's given a bid to join the fraternity, that uh, they've got equal rights and responsibilities within the fraternity. Uh, recognizing that when we extend a bid to a member. We recognize that they've got everything that they need to be successful, that they are true gentlemen, uh, and that uh, they've got a stake and ownership in the chapter from day one. Uh, the second uh, is to provide further accountability for chapters and individuals by formalizing some of our expectations. Uh, when we were having this uh, meeting in California to discuss uh, this program and developing it, uh, some of the undergraduate uh, representatives there stated they often had trouble uh, determining, uh, well, not really determining, but figuring out how to best hold brothers accountable uh, within the chapter. Uh, they felt that they needed some uh, more concrete guidelines, so hence uh, the uh, seven expectations of a member, which we'll go into later on. Uh, and then finally, recognizing uh, member education, that uh, as uh, we go throughout life, uh, education is a lifetime uh, process, so that we should, within uh, you know, the fraternity, uh, recognizing uh, and further providing education to our members uh, from the moment they enter the chapter and even beyond that uh, into um, their uh, life as an alumnus. So, and more details on that as we go forward. So the program cornerstones, we already talked a little bit about these, uh, at least three of these already. Uh, we talked about the, equal, the need for equal rights and responsibilities of members, uh, everybody uh, getting a fair shake and everybody equal. Um, a return to the original ideals of the ritual. Uh, what we mean by this is not just within the 96 hours, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, for a bid to initiate, uh, and not just, uh, you know, referencing the fact that there was no pledge process as we know it back in 1856. They, uh, you know, Newton Nash Clements got a bid uh, at one meeting, the next meeting he was initiated. Uh, but also referencing uh, and really tying into the continuous education and personal growth, going back to our roots that uh, all members had uh, scholarly essays they had to write once a week and uh, read to the chapter. So really focusing on developing the education of our members and learning from each other, uh, as well as uh, you know, from the best sources out there. Uh, continuous education and personal growth, as we talked about. Uh, accountability, we touched on uh, earlier. Uh, and then finally, mentorship. Uh, you know, one of the major uh, facets of this program is to re-engage alumni to make sure that every chapter has got a uh, good uh, advisory board or chapter advisors. Uh, to guide them and making sure that they make the best decisions possible, uh, not making the decisions for them, but making sure that they uh, make the best decisions possible, guiding them in those decisions, providing in, an institutional memory, uh, so to speak, for chapters, uh, and to uh, you know help them to, to grow uh, professionally and as men. So those are the program cornerstones, briefly. Uh, so there are three phases of the True Gentleman Experience. Uh, the first phase is the bid to initiate process. Uh, second phase is member education. Third phase is membership expectations and requirements. Uh, we'll go through each of these briefly. Uh, you know, if you've got questions along the way, feel free to enter them. 
Um, and uh, but there'll also be a Q and A portion at the end of this as well. Uh, I've said it. This might be the first time I'm saying this uh, tonight. I'm sure I'm going to say it three or four more times. Uh, this is all a work in progress. While we've got the basic structure out there, uh, you know, we want to hear from you. We want to hear about what challenges you may be facing. We want to hear about what questions you have, what you think may make this program more relevant, what you think may make this program more applicable. Uh, you know, we want to work with you through this implementation. Uh, we recognize this is a challenge and that we are, uh, these changes are changing uh, the very fabric and nature of some of the things that some people have held dear for so long. So, you know, we want to hear from you. Uh, so please, always never hesitate to contact your regional director, your province archon. Uh, my email uh, will be available at the end of this presentation. Uh, call or text me. Uh, you know, I'm always happy to uh, talk to people about this program or about SAE and our educational programs. So. So phase one, the bid to initiate process. This is probably where most of the attention has been at for a little while now. Um, so with the elimination of the pledge process, uh, uh, the entire pledge process, there's now 96 hours after bid acceptance. So once a uh, member accepts a bid, and there's a couple different ways the 96 hours kind of shakes out. I'll talk about those in just a second. Uh, but from the moment that the uh, member accepts the bid, They've got 96 hours for the chapter to report them on SAE.net and for the member to claim their SAE.net account slash sign the scope of association. Um, the SAE staff is going to link the accounts uh, between the SAE.net signups and being reported online within uh, one business day. And we'll actually, uh, you know, during the uh, busy recruitment seasons, uh, you know, when uh, we're going to be logging into, uh, you know, further link those up as they come along. Uh, so. You know, you won't be sitting there on the weekends. We will be following up with you, all, following up with those registrations as they come in. So, uh, report your member. Have your member cl claim their SA.NET account. Have them do that at the same time. If the things come in together, it's much easier for us to link these accounts. After their account has been linked, they uh, complete the Carson Starkey certification program. Uh, we want chapters, and we want their members, we want their members to continue completing this program. This is a, an essential part of membership as it outlines the basic uh, expectations um, and our policies and our procedures, Minerva Shield, uh, what they should be expecting and not be expecting uh, as part of their membership within SAE. Uh, still within that 96 hours, the chapter initiates them using the ritual of Sigma Alpha Epsilon, uh, following the initiation, reporting them online as initiated at SAE.net, uh, and then uh, you know, paying the 310 initiation fee within 10 days of the ceremony. Uh, so. When does the 96 hour start is usually the question I get right about here. Uh, there's really three different ways that this kind of breaks down. If you truly are a chapter on a campus that uh, offers bids 365 days a year, any time that you want to extend a bid to a member to have them join your chapter, when he accepts, that 96 hour starts. So in theory, you could be handing out bids and initiating people once a week, uh, you know, every other day uh, within that 96 hours. Uh, that's you know the model within this. If you are on a campus uh, that you can only extend bids during a limited period, let's say that you've got a rush or a recruitment week, uh, you know you recruit Monday through Thursday and Friday morning all the bids are due into the Greek Life Office. On that Friday, when all those bids are due, let's say it's at 9 a.m., all the bids are due to the Greek Life Office. 9 a.m. start your 96 hours. Um, in your third scenario, the third broad general scenario, uh, some of our Texas and Oklahoma schools operate this way. Uh, you know, if you were extending bids throughout the entire summer uh, and all the bids are due into the Greek Life Office at some day in August uh, or September, whenever the, those bids are finally all due, that's when your 96 hours starts. Now, in that last scenario, that does not mean that you should be operating a member education program. You should not be throwing socials for these uh, members who uh, have accepted bids, uh, but the 96 hours have not started yet. Uh, you know, they're just in uh, kind of a, uh, a holding pattern. So. When in doubt, and if there's things that, uh, scenarios that don't fall within this, talk to your regional director. Uh, we're aware of some campuses uh, that we're working through some of the details with, and we understand that, uh, uh, you know, with uh, more than 240, uh, different, uh, uh, 240 different franchises, so to speak, it's a little different everywhere. So we want to make sure that you're, uh, you know, getting the best that you can done with this. So, and we've got a question. Let's see. For phase one, our IFC has agreed to let our chapter run recruitment as long as we want. Are we allowed a month-long or even two-month-long recruitment period to ensure our prospective members are true gentlemen and then extend bids at the end of that period? 
how and when you choose to extend dids, uh, you know, remains at your chapter's discretion. Uh, you know, so what you should do before you extend a bid to anybody, you know, after a college degree, a bid to Sigma Alpha Epsilon should be one of the hardest things to get on your campus because you've got such a high standard and caliber of member. Uh, so get to know them ahead of time. That does not mean that you should run some sort of an underground pledge process. That does not mean that you should be, uh, you know, educating them on SAE before you extend them bids. Uh, you know, definitely get to know them ahead of time if you, before you hand out bids. Don't just hand out bids like uh, they're going out of style. Um, you know, so hopefully that answers your question. Uh, if that didn't, uh, follow up with me uh, afterwards or tomorrow and we can talk some more in detail. So, um, and continuing on. So there's still a little bit more within this uh, period. Great question. Thank you. Um, so within the 96 hours, right now the 96 hours should be uh, almost strictly administrative, making sure you get your reporting done. Uh, having members complete the scope of associations and the Starkey OCP. Uh, we recommend you hold a member orientation meeting. I'll talk about that in, on the next slide. Uh, it's important that during this 96 hours, uh, this is not a period for you to be rapidly educating the members on uh, the history of SAE. No education should be going forth during this 96 hours. It's administrative, no parties, no socials, uh, nothing involving alcohol during this 96 hour period. Um, now, we are getting questions about, well, can we have a brotherhood retreat? Can we have a gavel pass? Um, you know, as we continue to develop this program, if there's something you think should happen within the 96 hours, within the 96 hours let us know what your opinion is, um, and we can talk about that. Uh, we're assembling, uh, you know, a couple more committees, a couple more teams to discuss and further develop the program. And uh, the 96 hours is something we're going to talk about. Um, I think, think that there is good that could be done within that in terms of, uh, you know, getting to know uh, members better. However, you know, we need to use caution uh, and make sure that things don't, uh, you know, spin too wildly outside of what uh, we recommend uh, happen. So, next question. Uh, can we extend rush a couple weeks and then give out bids of recruitment? Good catch there. Uh, again, however you choose to hand out bids to your, uh, to, uh, you know, potential new members, uh, potential members, that's totally up to you. Uh, you know, SAE is not saying when you should hand out bids. Uh, you know, we're just telling you after somebody accepts a bid, here's, you know, your next steps. Uh, you know, you should always be taking as much time as possible, as much time as you feel is necessary within your chapter to get to know the people because, uh, you know, as it's often said, and this will ring true, uh, consider well the step for which you're about to take, for once you've entered, you've entered forever. So, you know, it's a lifetime commitment. So make sure you get to know the guys before you just hand out bids. Um, so, great question. So the member orientation meeting. Uh, this uh, is something that should be open to parents, advisors, alumni, university administrators. It's a chance for you to meet with the members who have accepted their bids uh, so that they've got a, a better feel for um, what exactly is going to be expected of them, what the requirements are. Uh, this is that chance for them to maybe the next day after the, uh, you know, after accepting their bid say, hmm, maybe we, uh, you know, maybe I don't want to do this. Uh, you know, during this time, this is when you can uh, talk. You can share with the parents, and you can share with uh, everybody and the uh, uh, members. Um, you know the expectations for the chapter. So, uh, you know, things that you should hand out to the people who've accepted uh, bids who are attending this meeting: uh, copies of chapter bylaws, membership directory, uh, listing of officers of your province archon regional director, as well as next steps, including uh, payment details that they need to complete the start the OCP. All these things. Uh, if you go to the uh, PDF of the uh, uh, True Gentleman Experience, uh, there is a sample member orientation meeting document in the back of it that provides you a uh, format for how you can go ahead and handle this. So, and we've got another question. Can we have requirements before we give a bid, such as rec reciting the True Gentleman in front of the chapter? That's a very interesting question, and I really don't think that would be a proper requirement for a chapter that sounds like you're requi you're requiring them to learn a heck of a lot more about your about SAE before uh, you know you're giving them a bid and asking them to recite the true gentleman in front of the entire chapter I would not recommend that for somebody that you've not yet given a bid to um, so let's follow up more offline uh, it's a good question but um, you know if you got to stop and wonder it's probably not a very good idea uh, so, but please, let's follow up tomorrow on uh, that question. Uh, so, continuing on. So, next steps for phase one. Uh, look at how you're extending bids to, to make sure, look at how you're extending your bids 
to make sure that your internal processes are solid and that your recruitment is strong. Do you know specifically what you're looking for in your members? Specifically. Not just that he's a good guy or he's, you know, really chill. Uh, but does you, do members that you're looking for, do they have to have a certain GPA? Do they have to be involved in a certain way on campus? Uh, you know, identify clearly what you're looking for in a member, and it'll make your recruitment process a lot easier. Also, make sure that whatever product that you're selling within recruitment is actually the product that the person gets when they join. There's nothing worse than a bait and switch. Um, I've got to be careful. I'll hop on my recruitment uh, soapbox for a minute. Uh, so, you know, really focus on recruitment. Uh, have your initiation team prepped and ready to impress your members. Uh, you know, make sure that if they're going to come in, they're going to have a good ceremony and they're going to have a good feeling for what's going on. Uh, and they're really impressed by our ritual. Um, budget accordingly to assist in paying the 310 per man initiation fee. Uh, we recognize the 310. That's a lot. and it's a lot up front. Uh, for chapters who can afford the uh, to budget and pay that in advance and have the chapters, uh, the uh, members pay you back afterwards, um, you know, we recommend doing that. For those that cannot, there are payment plans available. Um, and if you've got questions about any of this stuff, talk to your regional director. Uh, you know, we want to work with you through this process. Um, a question I usually get right about here is what happens if a person comes in, they're initiated, uh, they decide if they're initiated that they are not a fan of this, and they quit. Are we going to get the 310 back from the Fraternity Service Center? At this time, no, there are no refunds. It's an initiation fee. Uh, so once they're initiated, they owe that money. So we would recommend, you know, make sure you know what, uh, you know, make sure your guys are solid in terms of, uh, you know, they want to join. They recognize this is a commitment. Um, get them to sign promissory notes if you've got a billing company. Um, and, uh, you know, just consider well the steps which, uh, you know, they're about to take. So. Um, a couple of the general comments on phase one, uh, if you've got specific questions, talk to your regional director uh, or me, either way. Uh, we're currently developing some additional recruitment training for chapters, hopefully that's going to come online in the next month or so. Uh, we're also working on some materials to help you sell the benefits of the true gentleman experience. Um, and, uh, you know, like I said, we're further evaluating uh, what the 96 hours can look like. And I got some more questions. Do you recommend postponing the initiation of freshman a semester to get a better idea of GPA? Uh, well, once you extend somebody a bid, the 96 hours is in effect that you need to, uh, you know, initiate that person. Uh, if your chapter chooses to hold off handing out bids uh, until, you know, they've got a uh, college GPA, that again is something that uh, you can set within your internal, you know, chapter policies. Uh, so. Uh, think about that. But under no circumstances should you be uh, handing out bids to people and then having them sit around for a semester till you get a GPA. Uh, you know, with the 96 hours, you initiate within that 96 hour period. Uh, next question. Ooh, it's a long one. Uh, let's see. A lot of my chapter brothers have been asking, what do we say when a recruit asks us why we do not have a new member process? Uh, in other words, how do we approach this question and answer it in a positive light? Uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, when a recruit asks about why we don't have a new member process, uh, you know, the answer that I've been given uh, folks to give is that, uh, you know, by virtue of us extending a bid to you, we recognize that you've got all the, uh, the tools and the resources and the uh, character necessary to be a brother within our organization. Uh, you know, there doesn't need to be a trial period because you've got what it takes. We have confidence uh, that uh, you're going to succeed within our organization. Uh, so that's the first round of uh, selling that I do with that. Um, so there. So, uh, and we'll have other uh, things such as how to answer that question coming out, but that's my initial response to that, and that's a great question. So, um, great questions, everybody. Moving into phase two. Excuse me while I grab a sip of water. So, member education. So like we've said, recognizing that uh, education of members is something that uh, is a lifelong process, uh, especially with the, throughout the chapter. We're developing these experiences, uh, we're calling them experiences, uh, for uh, members. Uh, and they are uh, themed uh, and based off of where you're at within your development with, of a typical college student, a typical college career. Uh, you know, we recognize that some of this is a little idealistic because some people uh, join the fraternity later on. I'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. Um, and not every campus is the same. But uh, overall and basically, uh, you know, the loyalty experience, we're talking about that being the first year experience, uh, a basic introduction to Sigma Alpha Epsilon, 
the tools for success in college uh, in preparation for a chapter service. We want to give you your, your utility belt that you need to be successful uh, as an SAE within that first year, educating you on the fraternity. Years two and three are the friendship experience, uh, you know, focusing on your personal identity and values discovery and, uh, you know, focusing on your continued leadership development and uh, continuing to prep you for chapter service. Within your fourth year, really preparing you for uh, that uh, post, uh, you know, undergraduate career, uh, making you a productive and successful member of society. Um, and then lastly, the fraternity experience. Uh, when we were talking about developing this program, we felt that if we didn't create an optional program for alumni, optional uh, for alumni to complete, especially those graduating seniors, because uh, a lot of times, you know, um, an undergraduate will graduate, well, hopefully they all graduate, uh, but they'll graduate with a lot of fraternity zeal, and they'll say, how can I get involved? How can I keep my experience with SAE going? And they don't know where to go, and they don't know what to do. Uh, so we're hoping that uh, by providing this for them, they can figure out where best to direct their uh, file the juice accordingly. Uh, so, and question coming in. How many hours per month do these online courses or whatever take per man? Uh, right now, the uh, we're still developing the uh, courses and curriculum for uh, uh, for the fall for everybody. So we're con we're conscious of that. Uh, these are designed right now to be completed in uh, you know no less than six months, uh, no shorter. Let's see, six months to a year is what we're playing with for uh, how long to complete your experience. Uh, some of these courses are shorter. Uh, some of them you can complete in five or ten minutes, and uh, some of them, like if you're plugging along and reading through uh, SAE chapter, uh, SAE fraternity national history, that can take a little bit of time. Uh, you know, but we're working on that. So to answer your question, I don't have a specific per hour uh, because we got the accelerated one done pretty quickly. Uh, we are developing the rest of them um, in the upcoming months. So, uh, and more questions. Currently, as the EA, I'm the only one able to see the loyalty experience in the TGI, and I can't seem to figure out how to add my new members. How can I do this? Also, if a member joins as a junior, what experience levels do they start at? Great question. Uh, uh, well, if your new members are having trouble accessing the loyalty experience, connect with me, uh, and we will talk about that, because they should not be having any issues, because everybody in the entire fraternity has got access to uh, the loyalty experience. Uh, if a member joins as a junior, what we're talking about here is, uh, uh, and this is one of those areas we're still talking about uh, the details on, um, we think that uh, they should complete the national loyalty experience because that would uh, give them uh, the basic national tools about what the fraternity actually is. And locally, they should complete whatever uh, educational courses on the chapter and chapter structure. But the majority of a member who joins as a junior, his experience, should he should be onboarded at the uh, level where he's at. Uh, so a, for a junior, hopefully a course on study skills is not going to make a lot of sense because he's already figured it out. Uh, so we want to give him the tools he's going to need to be successful at the level he's at. So great question. Lots and lots of questions. Uh, let's see. Does the loyalty experience extend the, an, extend an entire year for everybody? For example, would kids that receive bids in the fall continue to go through this experience into the spring, or would they get bumped into the friendship experience? Uh, right now, it's designed that uh, it's uh, an entire year uh, to complete the program. Uh, you would not be bumped or accelerated early because of uh, the uh, timing uh, within it. So right now, it's looking at you know full year, uh, minute, full year maximum, six month minimum. So if you join in the spring, so people who join in the spring with a loyalty experience would start in the fall with the friendship experience. Uh, again, that's these are one of these areas that we are tightening up uh, and further developing. Uh, let's see. For those campuses that are, you know, five-year programs, we are, uh, you know, we're addressing that. We're trying to figure out what's the best way to address it to, uh, you know, provide you with a model and a direction to head in. Uh, so uh, we'll keep following. We'll keep working on that. All right, and these next two questions come about uh, requirements and educational details, and we're going to talk about that in local modules in just a second. So I'm going, hopefully, uh, my next couple slides will answer your questions. So um, the components of each experience, uh, there are three different types of components, um, three different types of components, uh, national required modules. These are the overall guiding and thematic sessions. These are the things that, regardless of whatever chapter that you are at across the country, you should be knowing this information. 
uh, things such as SA history, our national structure, our uh, health and safety policies, uh, just as an example of national modules. Uh, also, in the thematic session, uh, talking about, uh, you know, introducing the different concepts and areas that we're talking about educationally, and then at the local level, picking the local chapter picking up those concepts. Uh, so, I'll talk a little bit more about some of this in just a bit. Uh, Self-selected modules. Uh, this is something where the individual member can either complete something online for this. We're going to have some online modules for them to complete. Or let's say that there's something locally they want to do uh, that's going to uh, augment their uh, experience within the fraternity, let's, or within their fraternity or within their uh, academic experience on campus. Uh, let's say a lecture on William Faulkner or uh, an art exhibit uh, that they want to attend. Uh, these are things that chapter that uh, members can do to complete the self-selected modules. You know, self-selected module could also be attending the John O. Mosley Leadership School. Uh, so there's a lot of things that are already done that you as members are already doing uh, that uh, you as chapters are already doing that are going to be counting within this whole thing. Uh, we're adding very little. We're, you know, shaking up the way we're counting some of this stuff or that we're organizing it. Uh, and then finally, the local approved modules. We'll talk a lot about this in the next couple slides. Uh, for the fall, we're going to have a uh, program bank for uh, if you want to just find a program, download it and use it. Or this is your chance to take something that, uh, you know, your local chapter traditions. Uh, this is a chance for you to create your brotherhood events, uh, your, S your SAE local chapter history. This is where uh, the things which are specific to your chapter can be added into. So a lot of the stuff you're probably already doing is going to count into this. So uh, continuing on through. Um, so the member educator, and I see I've got some more questions. I'm going to end up answering those in a little bit uh, as part of the presentation. So uh, the member educator is the brother who's charged with developing the comprehensive plan for all this, along with uh, his committee. So, uh, you know, we recommend, uh, you know, a committee. It's probably a good idea to have a committee chair for each one of the different experiences uh, and uh, to help develop these programs. Uh, because what you're looking at is not just a, a hodgepodge or a myriad of uh, smaller little modules, but an actual comprehensive local loyalty education experience, a friendship education experience, an honor education experience. Uh, the member educator is going to track the local, self-selected, and national components. Uh, we've got uh, tracking information out there to help, and we're going to be launching some online tracking in the fall. Uh, and working with the member educator, um, each chair coordinates the uh, local experiences. Uh, so uh, here you can see a little diagram of that. But let's talk about the, just for example, the local loyalty experience. Uh, so there are three different components of that. Uh, the uh, national modules, the uh, you know that are done at the TGI, that's our uh, our bread and butter. Uh, the self-selected modules, I said it like the hybrid, and our local approved modules. So as you're developing these things, you know, let's look at local approved, your local history, your brotherhood, your chapter retreats. There are some things that you may plan. There are some things that you may do uh, that work well that can fill the uh, requirements for local approved modules across every year in the chapter. If a chapter retreat is something that you want to do that is an education and education of SAE, uh, you know, that counts for everybody that attends the chapter retreat to completing that experience. Uh, you know, team building exercises, guest speakers. Uh, so a lot of the stuff that you're probably doing already falls within these uh, requirements. Uh, so let's see. And we've got some questions here. Um, what if you don't end up finishing your modules in the time allotted? We're going to talk about that in uh, the uh, expectations of a member uh, in phase three. Will the Phoenix still be used for education, or is this all based on the modules? Uh, the Phoenix will remain the uh, member uh, education manual, uh, the manual for members of Sigma Alpha Epsilon. Um, as with any book, as soon as it's printed, it's out of date. So, uh, you know, as we uh, once we get through this uh, stock that we've got, we're going to be changing it, uh, you know, changing it around to reflect these. Um, so, we will be referencing the Phoenix for some of the educational programming we do. Uh, in cases where chapters, you know, are no longer relevant, we're not using those chapters, uh, and we're also posting the chapters online and developing them uh, into more of an online version of the Phoenix as well. So, but the Phoenix is still out there and it's still going to be shipped out to members. Um, for larger chapters, would it be acceptable to have two member educators? Uh, you know, sure, if it's going to work for you, you know, that that's no problem. I mean, I know a lot of chapters have got two uh, de eminent deputy archons, so. Um, so yeah, uh, next question, does the member educator do any of the actual teaching or is that put on the experience chair? 
that's up to the member educator and the chair. Uh, if the chair wants to do it, cool. If the member educator wants to do it, that's cool too. However you guys want to do it, I imagine a, uh, a team concept would work really well within that. Uh, for smaller chapters, can member educator also hold a chair position? Absolutely. Uh, you know, this is where you as chapters have got the flexibility uh, to uh, complete the, uh, to implement this as you see fit uh, to make the, uh, you know, the member education work best for your chapter. Uh, the important thing is to focus on that the entire chapter has education. Uh, next question, who, if anybody, approves self-selected modules? How is this tracked through the tracking system being rolled out in the fall? Well, right now, uh, the uh, any self-selected oh, well, I'm going to answer one part of the question uh, that I thought you were asking. Uh, local modules are approved by the chapter advisor uh, before they're taught. A self-selected module, let's say you wanted to go to that lecture on William Faulkner I may or may not have just mentioned. Uh, the member educator, you know, says that works, that fits within the uh, scope of the programming uh, that we're doing. Member educator tracks it right now on a piece of paper or on a spreadsheet. Uh, we, there's a neat feature on the TGI, if you look on the left, uh, called the transcript. And the transcript actually keeps track of every single thing you do on the TGI. We're going to be expanding that feature so that the member educator can enter in, uh, using a batch process, not individually, uh, enter in what's, what courses you are completing at the local level. So that way everything is tracked there and online. And then you can actually see at the end of your four-year career every, all the educational programs that you've attended uh, or been part of. So. Uh, great question. I wish I had some more fancy graphics to show you on the chapter admin, but we're still talking with our service provider to get those created. So uh, what exactly is member educator planning? Uh, there are four main categories uh, that all education needs to fall into. And these are broad enough that it should fit almost everything out there. Uh, education of a true gentleman. This is your education on SAE. It's national history. It's resources. Minerva Shield. Uh, this is your brotherhood activities, your events, your chapter retreats. Uh, mind and body of a true gentleman. Uh, this is recognizing that, uh, you know, a healthy mind and body are important. Uh, so these are things like time management skills, study skills, uh, information about substance abuse and mental health, uh, eating healthy. Uh, the third category, personal professional growth. Uh, you know, a gentleman needs a lot of tools at his disposal to be successful. So this is uh, information on living on a budget. Uh, simple things like uh, how to balance a checkbook, how to do laundry, social media do's and don'ts. What's interesting is I've actually gotten a huge pushback on uh, the relevancy of how to do laundry. Uh, and typically our uh, upperclassmen say that's not relevant, but to a freshman, the freshman may not know how to do laundry. That may be something that they forgot to ask, you know, mom or dad how to do before uh, they left for college. Uh, you know, so that's, uh, you know, relevancy, uh, you know, when you're planning, you've got to think about what's relevant to your audience. Is it relevant to a particular segment, such as your freshman? Uh, is it relevant to your seniors? Is, you know, Interview skills more relevant as a senior, uh, you know. Uh, so that's something member educators to think about. Uh, and then finally, leading is a true gentleman. So our leadership skills uh, and what we need to be successful as a leader. Um, all sessions uh, need to be, uh, you know, sessions as part of the educational plan uh, need to be approved by the uh, chapter advisor because uh, we want the chapter advisor needs to make sure that you know the education is not violating SAE policies, Minerva Shield, state, federal, local, university laws, etc. So. Keep that in mind, uh, you know, as you're planning your programs, don't violate our policies. If you're not aware of what our policies are, uh, you know, member educator, there's an OCP out there for you. You can talk to your health and safety chair. If you're not sure, talk to your chapter advisor. If they're not sure, you know, talk to your regional director, talk to me. Uh, you know, we want everything to be above board. Uh, you know, with this program, probably about 98% of the good things that you, your chapter was already doing are applicable and are going to uh, rotate into this process, into this new uh, structure. So uh, availability, uh, we are going to be developing the rest of these experiences and modules uh, to roll out for the fall of 2014. Uh, as soon as we get it out there, we're going to email all the chapters to say, hey, here it is, and here's how you do it. We know there's a lot of, we're not quite sure how this is going to work yet, and that's okay because we're still developing it. Uh, and we want your feedback as to you know, what may or may not work or what works better in some situations. So, uh, you know, keep that in mind, and we will be communicating how to do this. Um, you know, but for the uh, chapter who wants to really uh, dig in and get going, uh, you know, you know the, uh, the themes for the years. Uh, you know, if you want to start developing your uh, member education plans, you know, go for it and, you know, follow within those themes. So, uh, let's see, get another question. 
can the member educator choose which members do which experience level to ensure relevance? Uh, we are currently working on that, uh, and we're going to take that uh, under consideration. We're trying to figure out the best way to make sure that members uh, maintain education uh, throughout the years and that they can get access to the most relevant information for them. So, great question. Uh, Will those who attend leadership school this August be seeing the final product of the Trujillo Limited experience? Dear God, I hope so. <laughs> uh, I hope everything will be ready long before leadership school so we can roll it out. So, um, uh, you know, that's that's one of my goals. Um, but I'm kind of a one-man show up here right now. Uh, so we will uh, be getting that out there and, uh, you know, relying on our alumni volunteers and uh, undergraduates who are interested uh, to help develop some of this stuff. So. Uh, you know, once we get the plan, then it's just a matter of chugging and plugging and getting things out there for everybody. So the goal is for leadership school to show some, you know, here's how everything is. So great question. So phase two next steps. Have you elected, appointed, and or reported a member educator? The member educator can be reported online just like uh, any of your eminent archon or any of your other chapter officers that can be reported. Uh, once he's reported, your member educator has access to an online certification program at the tgi.sae.net. Uh, that uh, provides him with uh, not just this information, but a lot more specific information specific to him. Uh, I was trying to keep this presentation rather broad. Uh, has your chapter appointed a committee yet to help plan these uh, things? Uh, if your chapter had not yet already completed the uh, education for uh, people who joined this spring, uh, have you read the Accelerated Loyalty Experience and are you preparing the local modules to educate those who joined this spring um, You know, in those uh, educational requirements. And lastly, once again, if you've got questions, talk to your regional director, talk to me. Uh, we want to help you guys out through this. So uh, I'm appreciating all the good questions so far, gentlemen. Uh, it's been a very good webinar so far, and we're turning the corner here. So, uh, you know, and as of what's come up through some of the questions, we understand that some things may be more applicable at different times and different chapters. We're trying very hard to develop a product which will meet the needs of the majority of our members. Uh, to uh, guide them and help them be the best, to become the best versions of themselves possible, and also to develop a process and a program that is flexible enough for the various needs of our chapters. So uh, uh, it's a very challenging process, and we are excited by this. We hope that you're excited by this as well, uh, because we want your feedback. Like I've said, uh, you know, email the TGI at sae.net with any questions you have or things that you think may be relevant, and we're happy to uh, talk about that. Um, so the question, are the module requirements going to be different for colonies? Uh, no. Uh, with the exception of one or two, which won't appear for you uh, because they are you know, tailored to ritualistic type stuff, uh, you know, requirements are going to be the same. We, as we develop this program, as we develop everything else, and you know, as a colony, uh, you, know, you need to start working to operate just like a chapter does. So, the same requirements, the same operations, everything else, uh, you know, that's what we're shooting for. So, great question, though. Uh, I'm happy to see, uh, you know, some colony guys on the webinar. So, moving into phase three, membership expectations and requirements. So, at, uh, like I said, in California, uh, the question became, you know, what are some ways that we can hold, hold members accountable? Uh, so, we came up with these seven expectations of a member, having a 2.5 or higher GPA, uh, 2.5 is the fraternity law minimum, so nobody in your chapter should be in good standing right now if they don't have a 2.5 or higher GPA. Um, you know, and if your chapter has mandated a higher GPA, more power to you, and that's awesome. Uh, you know, uh, second requirement to pay all bills or uh, you know have a uh, be on a payment plan, uh, to be involved in at least one other campus or community organization, a minimum of 20 hours of community service per year, uh, 20 hours per year minimum. Uh, to meet the fraternity educational requirements, so that's all that stuff we just talked about in phase two, attend 85% of chapter meetings annually, and attend 75% of chapter ritual events annually. Uh, question I usually get here, why are why 85 and 75? Uh, we did the math and we figured we couldn't hold the same amount because of the you know less frequency of chapter ritual events. Uh, so that's kind of the reason the uh, numbers are different there. So. These are the expectations of a member. We expect members to annually complete all these requirements. Um, and I just got a question, and I think I'm going to answer that in a second. So let me get to the next Q&A part. So 
Uh, let's talk about the rights of a member. So these are the four rights of a member uh, that cannot be taken away unless the member uh, is uh, suspended, uh, expelled, or resigns. Uh, you know, the uh, member has got the right to be treated equally with all brothers and with dignity to be called a brother, uh, to wear SAE identification, the badge and the letters, to be properly instructed and understand the concepts and teachings of the ritual, uh, and to be given due process for all alleged infractions. So these are rights of a member. These are privileges of a member. A privilege is participation in chapter meetings. A privilege is voting on all issues at chapter meetings. A uh, privilege is participation in chapter activities such as social, sports, service, um, and participation in chapter committees. So it's very important, rights and privileges. Because uh, after the spring of 2015, um, the annual performance review, the, this is phase three, goes into effect. Uh, chapter standards board, the J board, will evaluate all members in the chapter to determine if they've met the seven expectations. Uh, you know, when it comes time for one of the members who's on the J board to be evaluated, he will, uh, you know, leave the uh, room for his evaluation. Uh, for those that did not, uh, yeah, so anyway, he's going to leave. Sorry, my phone went off. Uh, those that have met the seven expectations, job well done. Those that did not, it is recommended the chapter suspend them for either one semester or until the missing requirement is met. So. One semester would be if they uh, did not meet the uh, uh, something that could be made up. So uh, attendance at meetings. It's recommended they suspend, that you suspend them for a semester. Uh, if it's something they can make up, like paying their bills, their educational, suspend them until it's done. GPA is another thing that they could not make up the difference for. Uh, chapters will be required to submit a post-APR report uh, detailing the action taken. So the reason that we point out the rights and the privileges is that uh, you know we're recommending that you suspend them because they need to focus on getting their you know something together like with their grades or whatnot. Uh, if you choose not to suspend them, then you need to make darn sure that you uh, take away their uh, privileges. You know, a person who's not pulling his weight, a person who's not you know fulfilling everything they should be doing, their grades, their finances, they should not have the same privileges as somebody who uh, uh, you know has done everything else that they should. So, uh, and the question feed is blowing up. So let's see. Uh, so, if a member fails to meet an expectation, say not 85% of meetings are behind on dues, uh, are they in bad standing immediately or the following semester? It seems bad standing under these new laws means they aren't true members as they lose all rights and privileges, if I understand this correctly. So, uh, to answer that question, which I think I just did, uh, no, at the annual performance review, that's when you evaluate on the seven expectations, and they may lose privileges, but they do not lose rights. Uh, they will not lose the rights of a member unless you, uh, you know, suspend or expel them. Uh, can we start APRs early for the fall of 2014? Hmm. You're the first person to actually ask that question. Uh, The only issue I would see with starting it early is that the educational requirements would not necessarily be completed, uh, and you'd be judging them based off of one semester. Uh, so they may not have uh, all the uh, community service hours uh, taken care of. Um, so uh, you know, if you want to talk about, follow up with me after the webinar, not tonight, but tomorrow or the next day, and we can talk through some more of those details. Uh, you know, right now the the thought within this has been to do it at the end of every spring. Um, which is the next question, why after spring 2015 uh, and not sooner. Uh, we wanted to give everybody a full year to phase in that aspect, uh, th this aspect of the uh, true gentleman experience. Uh, that is why we picked spring of 15. Uh, so, um, but this is also something that we are, you know, further developing um, and, uh, you know, we'll have more information out in the, uh, in July and August about the APR. Uh, so, great question. Um, and more questions. How long should we keep someone suspended for before recommending that they are put up for expulsion? That's up for you guys in the chapter. Uh, you know, if someone's consistently not paying their bills, if someone is consistently not, not meeting the uh, you know expectations of a member, that's up to you guys to do. Uh, you know, the traditional trial process for expulsions remains in effect uh, for brothers who you know violate their oaths. Uh, so that has not changed. Uh, Let's see, next question. Will the badges, membership cards, etc., for the guys given a bid be delivered in time for the initiation 96 hours later? If not, do we just borrow active members' badges to get them during the initiation ceremony? 
Uh, great question. Unfortunately, I do not believe it's possible that it'll be possible to get you the badges within the 96 hours of them being reported, uh, strictly because of the uh, got to get the got to report them online. SAE.net, OCP. You can try. You know, if you got, uh, you know, if, if you report everybody, they get the, uh, you know, SA.net at the same time. Uh, you know, we get the, the timing is right and we can link them up immediately and they can all complete the OCP and you can then go online and initiate them all uh, and get us the money uh, for the 310 per man. That could be expedited shipping involved. It's possible. It's kind of a long shot, but it's possible. Uh, in the case that it's not, you know, we recommend that you borrow active members badge to give them during the ceremony. So. Uh, let me wrap up the rest of this presentation because it's brief and I'll hop back to the questions. So, uh, phase three, next steps are phase three. So make sure that your entire chapter acknowledges these seven requirements of a member. Uh, in the very back of the True Gentleman Experience PDF, there's a nice little uh, paper that uh, we created that you can print out and have everybody sign. Uh, it's important they understand what they're getting themselves into. Well, what, what, as a member, what the, it's expected of them is the better way to phrase that. Um, in that, uh, you know, we're going to be judging you. We're going to be checking to make sure you've done this stuff, uh, you know, whenever the APR starts. I would also make sure that you've elected or appointed a strong and fair standards board. Uh, you know, if your standards board process has been weak as of late, it may be time for you guys as a chapter to figure out best practices and to make sure you've got a process that works. Uh, uh, I said uh, previously, look for additional information about the uh, APR. Uh, annual performance review in August of 2014, if not a little before then. Uh, so this is another area that uh, we want your feedback about what may work better and uh, what ideas. And you guys have brought up some good stuff this uh, evening so far. So, um, And I'm going to go back to questions. This is the last slide, so if you've got questions, now's the time to keep typing them in there. So uh, next question. So if someone does not attend the majority of rituals or chapters or stops paying dues, do we have to wait until the review to take any action? No. I mean, if you... You know, if you want to bring somebody up for suspension or expulsion for failing to uh, meet the obligations of a member, take action whenever you want to. Uh, you know, this that's just that uh, the APR is just that one time uh, to, uh, you know, go out there and uh, make sure everybody's doing what they said they were going to do. So, great question. Uh, the uh, judicial processes have not changed. Uh, you can always bring somebody up for uh, failing to meet the expectations of a member uh, or violating their oaths. Uh, my chapter has already put into consideration to either expel or suspend two new members. If we decide to expel them, what will this look like now? Uh, well, if you're going to expel somebody, the uh, go to fraternity laws uh, under, uh, it's in the very back, uh, I think it's discipline of members of the section, and expulsion involves a chapter. A chapter. Uh, so um, that process, check that out in the back of the book. Uh, that's the process that you do to expel or suspend a member. Uh, officially within fraternity laws. Uh, if they do not meet the requirements, are they taken to trial or does the standards board choose the punishment? Um, if they do not meet the requirements, are they taken to trial or does the standard board choose the punishment? Well, uh, if they're not meeting the requirements, uh, you know, if the chapter is going to choose, you know, if the standards board, you know, it's got its discretion. Uh, it's got, it, remain, it maintains professional discretion. Maybe the member did not meet all the uh, uh, chapter meetings because he, you know, has been sick in the hospital. Well, you know, we, you know, don't want you to be looking at this purely, you know, as a uh, yes or no issue. Uh, you do maintain professional judgment, just like you, you know, in the uh, uh, world outside of the college, you've got professional judgment as well. Uh, so to answer your question specifically. Uh, that's something that the uh, the J board, your standards board, needs to talk about. Uh, do I have an official recommendation right now? Uh, my recommendation would be uh, the standards board needs to make the recommendation to the chapter uh, because a trial is something that you know you've got to do that if you want to suspend or expel. So uh, I think I answered that one. If not, we can talk some more. Uh, as you can tell, it's clearly something we have not. Uh, you know, we're still addressing and we're thinking about. So. Uh, let's see, would the first APR be after the spring 2015 semester or would it not start until after that semester? Uh, it would, the way we've scheduled it, we thought about this, the APR for spring 2015, it would start after grades come out. So uh, in May of 2015 or April 2015, whenever the grades come out for that uh, academic period. So it could be June based off of, uh, you know, how your uh, university works. So. 
Good questions. Anybody have any other questions? And we've got another question. Um, should the member educator be a standing member on the review board? Uh, you actually bring up a good point. So within the review board, uh, within those seven areas, there's uh, a lot of folks who are kind of got, uh, you know, a finger in the mix for uh, how to uh, get all the information that you need. You'll need to talk to the member educator to get the, uh, you know, the educational completion. You need to talk to the scholarship chair probably for GPA, the treasurer to make sure he's paid his bills, the, your uh, service or philanthropy chair to make sure he's got his hours. Uh, so there's a lot of folks you're going to need to talk to in coordination uh, in terms of how to get the uh, information you're going to need. Uh, specifically as to should the educator be on the review board, that's a decision for you within the chapter. Uh, if you think that'll be advantageous to you uh, to have him on there. I mean, you can always invite brothers in to speak, uh, you know, on things, but this is... Well, I said it, it shouldn't be yes or no, black and white. To an extent, it also kind of is. You know, uh, you know, yes or no, did they meet this, 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 this? Did they have extenuating circumstances? Uh, so, uh, again, that's a chapter decision if you want to put the member educator on the board. Um, how do we report the completion of local modules that are required on May 1st? Uh, you don't report that to us. Uh, that is something that's maintained at the chapter level. Uh, hopefully, your chapter advisor has approved those. Uh, and your goal is just to have all the education completed for members uh, on May 1st. Uh, there is no good way for uh, myself here or anyone else to really check uh, the completion because education, some chapters had already completed education, some chapters don't take, um, you know, spring uh, members. Uh, and it's hard because every chapter is a little bit different in terms of when their education was taken forth. So, uh, Completion of local modules, that's totally on the chapter uh, side. Do you recommend electing a J board or having the warden choose it on a case-by-case -case basis? Uh, I think best practice would best practice is to have an elected J board. Uh, you know, so I would uh, review your processes for that. Uh, having the warden choose it on a case-by-case -case basis, that may not uh, allow for the fairest uh, representation, um, you know, because it, you know, happens on case-by-case, -case, uh, you know, so I would, you know, I recommend electing uh, your standards board. Our chapter is definitely considering postponing giving a bid to incoming freshmen until the spring. If we wanted to give them a sort of placement card that said, yes, we are interested, but would like to wait until we see your grades, would that be acceptable? It sounds like you kind of want to give them a bid, but you kind of don't at the same time. Um, Let's follow up and let's talk some more about that. Uh, telling someone that you're interested in giving them a bid, but not giving them a bid until the spring, um, you know, telling, hey, we're interested, stick around, talk to us in the spring is fine. Uh, I think the bigger question would be, you know, are you also expecting to have members, having these guys that are kind of having a placement card, uh, are you expecting them to hang around you with you in the chapter? Are you expecting them to do other sorts of educational stuff or to come to your socials. Uh, if that's the case, then uh, no, they should not be affiliating with you, uh, you know, during that time frame. But uh, let's talk about that afterwards. So great question. Um, you know, when you ask yourself, uh, you know, uh, the question of, you know, does it look like a duck? Does it sound like a duck? Is if it, you know, if it looks like a, mem a member process or a new member process, if it looks like a pledge process, uh, it sounds like a pledge process, it, you know, could be a pledge process. So. Um, can those on J board have other positions? Also, what happens when an elected member of the J board is on trial? Uh, you know, let's to the gentleman asking that question. Let's follow. Feel free to contact me or your regional director, and we can talk more about specifically J board operations. Uh, these are some great questions that you're having, um, but I'd rather us follow up afterwards. So. Uh, let's see. Next question. I'm confused how the MR would work because it's after grades. Member review, I guess. Uh, how the member review would work because it's after grades. It would also be after elections, so it would be a brand new elected standards board review in the members, right? Uh, yes, uh, if I'm following that. Uh, the new, well, it depends on when you elect uh, your standards board. 
Some chapters do elections in May, some chapters do elections in December, some in January. Uh, so not necessarily, uh, but I mean your standards board would be reviewing everybody. So, um, And with that being said, gentlemen, we are right up on the uh, uh, turn of the hour. So uh, if you've, these have been some great questions. This has actually been the best night of questions so far. Um, best night of questions so far. So, uh, you know, if you've got additional questions or more the discussions you want to have, uh, you know, please feel free to contact me and we can talk about it. Um, talk to your regional directors. I thank you all for your time this evening, uh, you know, and I thank you for your support of this program. Uh, you know, gentlemen, bye, Alpha. Have a great evening. And go register for leadership school, please. Uh, registration closes June 2nd. Have a good one.